At 7.30 a.m. on the 10th of June 1982, a Royal Mail employee was walking across Blackfriars Bridge in London when he saw the body of a man hanging from a construction scaffolding by means of a rope around his neck and suspended above the River Thames. When the dead man's body was retrieved, he was found to be carrying thousands in cash of various currencies, as well as papers containing the names of very high-profile Italian public and business figures, along with strange cryptic ciphers and codes, and his pockets were also stuffed with construction bricks. The body turned out to be that of none other than Gian Roberto Calvi, one-time Vatican Bank associate and member of the powerful and highly secretive illegal Masonic lodge known as Propagande Due, or P2. What made this incident so remarkable is that within the Propagande Due Masonic lodge itself, they referred to themselves, the members that is, as the Black Friars. And here was one of the most infamous Black Friars of them all, Roberto Calvi, hanging dead from Blackfriars Bridge in London and only hours after witnesses had stated that he was seen trying to but refused access to the Grand Masonic Lodge headquarters in London at Freemasons Hall. Calvi the Mason was found dead in the mysterious heart of the City of London with its Grand Masonic Lodges and the famous Knights Templar Church nearby. Along with the Vatican and Washington DC, the City of London is an autonomous state and is not subject to the laws of, nor even considered to be part of the United Kingdom, created by royalty and occult secret societies for the purpose of clandestine banking and political machinations, the City of London's private police force is likewise not answerable even to Scotland Yard. If ever there was a ritual and symbolic debt, then Roberto Calvi was most certainly one. However, his death was quickly ruled a suicide, although this was later changed to an open verdict, and the conspiracy theory surrounding his symbolic demise soon and very understandably began to take root. Especially as the City of London coroner, Dr. David Paul, who examined Calvi's corpse, was close friends with Queen Elizabeth's husband, Prince Philip. Much of the growing suspicion surrounding the circumstances of Calvi's death was due to the fact that the City of London police also ignored vital evidence proving he could not have taken his last walk on the scaffolding by himself, as this would have left easily traceable residue on the bottom of his shoes. It seemed more likely that Calvi had been murdered, and whomever and whatever was behind his killing were the liberty making a very real statement in how his corpse was being presented and displayed. His death was both ritual and revenge. In the final hours of his life, Calvi had frantically knocked on the front door of the main London Freemasonic Lodge while performing the sign of the grand hailing of distress. And whoever refused him at the front door clearly knew who this Blackfriar was and was not to grant him this sanctuary inside the lodge. Roberto Calvi was a dead man walking from that point on, as his only hope of survival was now gone. Roberto Calvi was born into a well-to-do Italian banking family connected with the Banco Commerciale Italiana. Following in his father's footsteps, Calvi joined the bank after the death of the dictator Benito Mussolini during a turbulent time in Italian history. The turmoil of post-World War II Italy may have been the reason why Calvi then took a more secure position at the much larger Banco Ambrosiano in 1947. The Banco Ambrosiano organization named after the 4th century St. Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, who was considered one of the architects of the Roman Church, was a strictly Catholic bank at the time, and all employees were expected to present the baptismal certificate so as to prove 
their religious affiliations. The ambitious Calvi soon moved up in the ranks and found himself in the Banco Ambrosiano boardroom as the personal assistant to the bank's president, Carlo Alessandro Canisi. By 1975, Roberto Calvi became the chairman of Banco Ambrosiano, making him a very influential figure within Italian society. He had also turned the bank into a global empire, mainly through currency trading and the setting up of large numbers of shell companies, which fed directly into the bank's coffers via interest on enormous loans. Regardless of all this success, many people who knew Roberto Calvi personally considered him a very cold and distant individual. He was particularly known for his cold dead stare. Associates also remarked that he was never known to give a direct answer to a direct question, which is often the telltale sign of a high-ranking Freemason. Even so, his business acumen was considered formidable and brilliantly clever for the era. It was no surprise at all that someone of his personality type would be drawn to the Propaganda Dewey Lodge and the promises of even greater wealth, power and control it potentially provided. Yet, at the very zenith of his career, something was to take place within Banco Ambrosiano during the late 1970s and early 80s, which resulted in the Bank of Italy stripping Calvi of his title the day before his alleged suicide in London. By the mid-1970s, the bank had already went from a respectable financial institution and into the world of shady money laundering involving the Mafia as well as the most powerful gang of them all, the Vatican, in all of this under Roberto Calvi's watch. To make matters even stranger, his own private secretary, Graziella Corocero, had allegedly jumped to her death from the bank's headquarters the day before Calvi's own body was found swinging from Blackfriars Bridge. Calvi was not only a dangerous man, but he was dangerous to know or even be around. Wherever he walked, he carried the craft and rituals of propaganda Dewey with him, and anyone finding themselves in the dark shore of Calvi or P2 usually paid the price with their lives. Within hours of his body being found, it became apparent that Calvi could not have gained access to the scaffolding from either the bridge or the side of the river and it appeared that the only manner in which he was able to get to the location was by means of a boat. Most who knew Calvi said that suicide would have been out of the question as his enormous ego would have wanted a showdown in public with his enemies so as to destroy them. Unfortunately for Calvi, his list of enemies was far more powerful than his ability to outsmart any of them. Under intense pressure from researchers, and the Calvi family itself, the City of London Police eventually reopened the case in September 2003, this time as a potential murder inquest. Soon, even more bizarre details came to light when it turned out that Roberto Calvi had spent the previous night in the apartment of a gangster named Sergio Vaccari. But why did his alleged assassin leave the P2 documents potentially naming its secret membership? The assassin had left these on purpose, not only as a warning to others, not to cross P2, but also as a diversion so as to put any media focus away from British high-ranking society being directly involved and in particular the royal family inside Buckingham Palace. This suggests that high-ranking British Freemasons were actually in on the initial murder of Calvi and not just the whitewashing of his death being declared a suicide on behalf of some Italian Freemasonic brothers. The mother's sons, as they are known, from London and Italy, were in on it together. However, Calvi's murder was to be seen exclusively as an Italian job. This suggests knowledge and cooperation in Calvi's killing went to the very summit of British society. The ruthless overt display of the hit was completed when Sergio Vaccari himself was also found dead, soon after Calvi was found hanged. Dead men, all of them, tell no tales. And the killing of Calvi's assassin adds to the case that the documents were left with Calvi's corpse 
on purpose. Propaganda Dewey, like the Italian Mafia, wanted to seal their reputation by leaving their calling cards for all to see as a warning to the world. However, this killing took place in the heart of British Freemasonry and could not have been sanctioned without the blessing of high-ranking British Freemasons. Eventually a murder verdict was given to Calvi's death. However, this was decades after the body was found, making any conclusive case leading to a successful prosecutions of any individuals highly unlikely. In recent years, Calvi's murder has been attributed to him having mismanaged and lost monies belonging to the Sicilian Mafia when Banco Ambrosiano collapsed. Italian investigators fingered a mafia operation in London under the orders of the leadership of Propaganda Due as being the ones who hired Vicari to kill Calvi. Although this remains highly speculative to this day, several parties having a vested interest in getting revenge on Calvi, but all of them connected to either Freemasonry or the Catholic Church. Remarkably so, as both groups are traditionally enemies of one another. This bizarre arrangement between Propaganda Due British Freemasonry and the Vatican was more a case of making sure what Calvi really knew when he died beyond the superficial planted documents upon his person stayed with him in his grave. While Propaganda Dewey were eager to demonstrate their viciousness to the world, other more bread and butter Italian gangsters also wanted their own dealings kept quiet regarding Calvi. This led to a string of other murders in both the UK and Italy, making it seem as if anyone who was involved with Calvi to any degree involving banking or money was in grave danger. An element of panic and tidying up all loose ends seemed central to these murders. A big secret was being kept secret. At the very outset, Calvi's death would have been just another notorious mafia hit, and this indeed was the prevailing sentiment within the British media except for one aspect, and that being the relationship between Calvi and the Vatican, which went right up to the papal throne itself. As the body count connected to Calvi continued to climb, including the suspected members of the Neapolitan Mafia gang in London directly implicated in assisting Sergio Vaccari in being his killer, more and more the focus moved towards Calvi's coziness with the Holy See while he was still alive. There were as many bishops and cardinals around Calvi as there were gangsters, corrupt politicians and business tycoons. The story then took another remarkable turn of events when in 2005 Licchio Gelli, generally considered the Grand Master of the Propaganda Due Lodge, along with several others, was placed formally under investigation on charges of having ordered Calvi's murder. The reason being so to prevent Calvi from using blackmail power against his political and institutional sponsors from the world of masonry belonging to the P2 Lodge or the Institute for Religious Works, with whom he had managed investments and financing with conspicuous sums of money, some of it coming from La Costa Nostra, and public agencies. The Institute for Religious Works is more commonly known as the Vatican Bank, which was implicated during the investigation into the mismanagement of Banco Ambrosiano as being the central entity in the entire affair. Among the details uncovered was that during the Humanus Vitae decree, which forbid Catholics from using artificial contraception, that the Vatican was the primary shareholder in the pharmaceutical companies producing the contraceptive pill. The Vatican Bank was also shown to be involved in weapons producing factories and many operations owned by South American dictators as well as global mafia cartels. The Institute for Religious Works was rotten to the core due exclusively to a cozy agreement between Calvi and at least one cardinal and several bishops. Even so, due to the autonomous nature of Vatican City, scores of priests, bishops and even cardinals avoided investigation and possible prosecutions during the scandal. But the cat was out of the bag that the Vatican Bank was shown to be a corrupt institution and Roberto Calvi was the one person 
along with Pope Paul VI, directly overseeing this corruption and at the time it was taking place. Pope Paul VI himself was known to be a homosexual and a lover of the TV actor Paolo Carlini. And so the Pope was compromised and in no position to go to public war with propaganda due following the initial Branco Ambrosiano scandal. It was in within such social and private circles that Roberto Calvi became acquainted with the internal workings of the Vatican, not only in relation to their vast financial power and influence, but also their many secrets and hidden indiscretions. These indiscretions would have been very useful to the inner circle of propaganda Dewey for blackmailing purposes. When Calvi began his association with the Catholic Church, the Vatican Bank was sitting on top of enormous sums of cash and land holdings obtained in the 1930s, which had been presented to the Holy See as compensation by the fascist regime of Benito Mussolini. Fully aware of these underutilized assets, Calvi turned the Vatican Bank into a global empire in and of itself and reorganized the operation into a professional modern banking corporation. When Calvi arrived at the Vatican Bank, it was still issuing handwritten and stamped drafts, and its administration was essentially a typing pool of nuns. Within no time, Calvi had installed a state-of-the-art computer system and telecommunications network, and modernized the operation and infrastructure of the bank as a whole. Profits soon soared, and Calvi found himself the golden boy of many cardinals within the Holy See. However, other voices within the Vatican wary of Calvi were suppressed or dismissed. This included Cardinal Albino Luciani or John Paul I as he would be known for a short period of time. Much of the creation of the wealth within the bank via Calvi's involvement was due to shady dealings by means of South American dictatorships and clandestine shell companies in Panama and the Bahamas. However, Calvi's main legacy within the Vatican Bank during his tenure was that he healed the long-standing rift between the Holy See and Freemasonry, when certain cardinals within the church knew that they had to make this alliance with propaganda Dewey's highly controversial and now extremely powerful secret society. Propaganda Dewey by this point was so entrenched into the upper echelons and every aspect of Italian society, from mass media to local and national government and even the military that it was practically a state within a state. So much so that by the late 1970s, Propaganda Dewey was running Italy by controlling all state bodies and institutions. The Holy See considered P2 as the de facto Italian government, and in many ways, this was a correct assumption. While at the same time, P2 needed the Vatican to expand their own network outside of Italy and into other Catholic nations, it was very literally a match made in hell. Originally founded in 1877 in Turin, a city famous for its Luciferian affiliations and alleged gateway to hell, Propaganda Dewey was soon to become one of the most powerful lodges in all of Italy, thanks mainly to the membership he made up of the old Piedmont aristocracy. However, by the 1960s, P2 was declining in influence as a lodge in terms of membership and stature, as Freemasonry in Italy as a whole fell out of fashion and popularity due to organized crime gangs such as La Costa Nostra growing in power and influence, particularly in the south of the country. Licio Gelli considered P2 to be a sleeping giant and soon took over as Grand Master to reorganize the launch into a very different beast than it had been originally, taking influence from La Costa Nostra he devised even more secretive and darker rites based on religious blasphemies such as the burning of the saints ritual and varied blood oaths that were far more serious than the play-acting versions of, say, Scottish Rite, Freemasonry. The code of silence or be murdered was very appealing to the more criminal elements of Italian politics and industry, as the seriousness of any violation which would result in death made Propaganda Dewey perhaps the most internally secure organization in the world for ambitious megalomaniacs and, and psychopaths. There were even rumors that members who had broken their oaths would be actually murdered inside the lodge house in Turin in front of the other members. 
Others would be nailed shut alive in coffins and buried screaming in various old locations around Turin and left to die on the ground. Rather than being disturbed by these ritual killings, the average P2 member would see them as something of an insurance policy among the membership as a whole. Who would dare break the oaths of a lodge that ritually kills or buries alive those who betray the fraternity? Nervously and eventually, the Grand Order of Italy, the country's oldest and the most established leadership lodge, officially expelled Kelly and the Propaganda Dewey in 1976 with the intention of removing their place with an Italian Freemasonry altogether. This, however, was essentially a public relations exercise as soon as it was being reported that Gelli was actually running the Grand Orient Lodge in Rome as his own personal lodge following the mysterious deaths of several Grand Orient members in the mid-1970s. It was not until 1981 that P2 were officially outlawed when their connections between Gelli, Calvi and the Vatican Bank were made known. The scandal surrounding Calvi and his dealings at the Banco Ambrosiano were so seismic with the Holy See that upon his appointment as Pope on the 26th of August 1978, Pope John Paul I implemented the start of an investigation of the Vatican Bank and Calvi's mismanagement. However, this soon ended when Pope John Paul I was found dead in his papal apartment 33 days later on the 29th of September. 1978 at 4.30am with an expression of agony on his face. It was determined that he probably died at 3.30am, the witching hour, another ritual killing. This also speaks volumes on the dark power and the very nature of propaganda Dewey in that a Pope would be murdered by them inside his own papal apartment before a banker like Calvi was taken on a boat to be hanged from Blackfriars Bridge in London. Upon finding the Pope's dead body, Sister Vicenza first contacted Cardinal Vilo, a Rosicrucian and member of Propaganda Dewey. Vilo was a notorious figure inside the Holy See and had been dismissed by the new Pope only a few days previously. Within hours of Pope John Paul I being found dead, Cardinal Vilo had removed or destroyed all the personal papers that had been in the dead pontiff's possession on the night of his death. With this whitewashing operation inside the dead pope's papal apartment, large numbers of high-ranking Catholic clergy gave a collective sigh of relief when, due to this, the investigation into the Vatican Bank died with the pope. Propaganda Dewey Rituals which have been made known public by ex-members are rare, and the more violent rituals still remain hidden to avoid possible murder prosecutions of those involved. Generally, all orders were given to the fraternity from the inner core known as the Wolf Pack. This was 12 Propaganda Dewey elites dressed in black satin with KKK-style hoods. The Wolf Pack were hand-picked by Likio Geli and are also trained assassins. Their primary duties are to protect the Grand Master and kill any Propaganda Dewey Lodge member who betrays the code of Il Momentum di Passare Al, the time for real action. The occult ritual surrounding the investiture of Propaganda Dewey members and their initiation commenced with seven knocks on the inner chamber door. These knocks would take place randomly. The prospective P2 member then announced themselves as the Pagan who wished to enter. Two guards carrying automatic weapons would then bring the initiate to the centre of the room where he stood before the wolf pack with his back to all twelve of them. His identity would be only known to the Grand Master but to no one else. The initiate was then quizzed with specific questions by each of the elites of the order. The Pagan was not permitted to answer directly. Instead, he relayed his answers via one of the guards escorting him. The Grand Master would then state, Pagan, are you prepared to die in order to preserve the secrets of Propaganda Dewey? As these are the only questions the initiate was allowed to answer for himself, he would reply, I am. Do you have the necessary qualities of contempt for danger? 
I do. Do you have the necessary qualities of courage? I am courageous. Do you proclaim yourself anti-communist? I do. And pagan, are you prepared to fight and perhaps face shame, even debt, so that we, who may become your brothers, may destroy this government and form a presidency? I am. Following this, the blindfold was removed, and the initiate was then ritually exposed to the light of Lucifer. From this point on, now a member of Propaganda Dewey, this individual had promised to give his entire existence over to the Lodge, and was to carry about any order which was to given to him, or he would be put to death. This was not a symbolic gesture by any means, and at some point there is every chance that now being a member of Propaganda Dewey, he will personally witness treasonous members of the Lodge being killed before his own eyes. These were the stakes being played for within Propaganda Dewey when one became a member. The final official part of the Roberto Calvi saga came to a close in 2007 when the murder charge was dropped due to insufficient evidence in order to prosecute the alleged parties behind his killing. In the 25 years since his body had been found, large numbers of people still refused to give evidence and has generally assumed that they would have joined the already large body count in and around this case if they had spoken up, not just only facing possible and grim repercussions from Italian Freemasonry or the Mafia, but from the Vatican itself. We are talking about a Masonic Lodge who actually went as far as murdering a Pope. Is it any wonder that so many people decades later were still unwilling to come forward? If the Holy See, being one of the main beneficiaries of Calvi's death, hiding the murder of a pontiff who could have finally allowed the police into the Holy See and investigate them once and for all. Calvi's murder was small fry by comparison to the overall stakes that were being played for. Most intriguingly of all is the mysterious events involving Calvi at the front door of the London Masonic Lodge the night before his death. Calvi was seen sweating and hysterical, demanding to be allowed sanctuary and protection. Did a phone call come from the Vatican to the Grand Masonic Lodge of London concerning what was to be done to the Pope's banker and Blackfriar? The answer has to be yes. P2's reputation being known outside of Italy was well noted when the front door of the Freemasons Hall was closed in the face of Roberto Calvi. It was the closing of an occult rite, and Calvi was to be the sacrifice upon the altar of Blackfriars Bridge. Pagan, do you have the necessary qualities of contempt for danger? I do.